we can make a start here. Yeah? The best, best students are here, so we can start. So to continue with bainite today, uh, in the last lecture I explained that the shape of bainite in three dimensions is like a plate because if you look at this optical micrograph which is taken on simultaneously on two surfaces, you can see that the plates cross on both of the surfaces, which means that these are actually plates in three dimensions. And there are two other things which are important in this uh, micrograph. First of all, that inside this bainite you can see some kind of structure. Okay? Uh, it doesn't etch uniformly black, right? And secondly, that the martensite here etches much lighter than the bainite. Uh, and that is because the martensite has not been tempered. It's simply transform partially to bainite and then quench. So if the martensite hasn't been tempered, then there are no carbides in it. And therefore, it has a high etching resistance because the carbide particles will provide interfaces which can be attacked by the etchant. Okay? So you can, in an optical microscope, distinguish between bainite and martensite as long as there is this structure inside the bainite plates which is attacked by etchants. Even though the resolution is not sufficient to see individual platelets, you can distinguish between bainite and martensite in an optical microscope. I also showed you in the last lecture an image of the displacements due to the bainite transformation. And this image is taken using a technique called atomic force microscopy, which has a very, very high resolution. And you can see that there is a very large shear deformation here associated with each plate. But I also pointed out to you that if you look at the adjacent austenite, then it has relaxed by plastic deformation. And that relaxation is extremely important and it happens because at the temperature where bainite forms, the austenite is mechanically weak, right? Whereas when we form martensite at a low temperature, the shape deformation can be elastically accommodated. Now I'm going to show you that in this region where you have plasticity in the austenite, that will interfere with the formation of bainite. Okay? Yeah? So, uh, what, what did you say? Uh, so, the, uh, unlike martensite, the stopping is not the grain boundary. Yeah. So, it must be smaller than martensite for equal length grains. Correct. So, uh, uh, an important point uh, that when the reaction stops because we have deformed the austenite, the plates of bainite will be much finer than plates of martensite which are only stopped by the austenite grain boundaries. Okay? So why should dislocations in the austenite stop the bainite transformation? Any ideas? Uh, certainly, uh, the dislocations will interfere with deformation, but why specifically does it stop the reaction? Okay, don't worry. This is a, an effect which is known as mechanical stabilization. Now, normally when we are producing millions and millions and hundreds of millions of tons of steel, we thermomechanically process, right? And that actually accelerates the transformation. When you deform austenite in the rolling mill, it introduces defects, finer grain sizes, and so on, and then the ferrite forms with a finer grain structure. That's because that ferrite is forming by a reconstructive transformation mechanism. That means when the ferrite forms, it destroys the defects. That adds to the driving force of transformation. But in the case of displacive transformations, defects interfere with the progress of transformation because it's like hardening the material. A dislocation cannot move easily in a hardened material. Okay. So I'm going to go into mechanical stabilization. Uh, this is illustrating the ideal shape change where the shape change is accommodated elastically where you see a single tilt like this. Okay. But what's happening with bainite is that you get this plastic relaxation in the adjacent austenite. So there's a lot of plasticity here, and therefore you will introduce a lot of 
dislocations in the austenite near the bainite. So this is a transmission electron micrograph taken at the interface between the austenite and the bainitic ferrite. So this is the bainitic ferrite and this is the austenite. You can see intense tangles of dislocations, right? Because the austenite relaxes. So you look at the density of dislocations here. So this is seen in the atomic force microscope, the relaxation, and we can of course see it in a transmission electron microscope. <coughs> okay, uh, why, what causes the interface, supposing we forget about plastic accommodation, we've got an interface between austenite and either bainitic ferrite or martensite, what causes the interface to move? Sorry? Uh, sorry, say again louder. Diffusion, you said, did you? Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, in other words, what, what is actually moving when the interface moves? That is a better question. Yes, uh, the interface dislocations, right? So, yeah, the interface consists of dislocations and it's the dislocations which move, which cause the transformation, the shape deformation and everything, right? So, in ordinary deformation, what causes a dislocation to move? It's a shear stress, right? So where does the shear stress come from when I'm cooling my material from the austenitic state? Where does the shear come from? Uh, I'm sorry, but... Yeah, but we haven't had transformation until the interface moves. So what I want to know is what, where does the shear stress come from? In other words, free energy change, yeah? So what are the units of free energy change? Joules per mole. And what are the units of a stress? Megapascals is the same as joules per meter cubed. Exactly the same, because a pascal is a newton times a meter, a newton per meter, yeah? Sorry. A pascal is newton per meter squared. If I multiply top and bottom by meters, then I have newton meters, which is joules per meter cubed. Okay? So the stress that drives this interface actually comes from free energy change. Uh, we've said that we need a shear stress from somewhere. And where does that shear stress come from? Well, it comes from the chemical free energy change when austenite wants to transform into ferrite. So this is the difference in the free energy between the austenite and ferrite. And you can simply write that the shear stress is equal to the free energy change. They have exactly the same units. And without that free energy change, there's no movement of the interface. If there is a driving force, then the interface moves forward. So this shear stress comes from the chemical free energy change, the difference in the lattice stabilities of austenite and uh, ferrite. Yeah? Yes, you could, you could say that. That's right. Okay? So it's the chemical free energy change which is providing the stress, which moves the dislocations in the interface, which causes transformation. Everyone happy with that? Okay, so we've got a shear stress which is driving the interface and there will be something which opposes that because we've created a lot of dislocations in the material, yeah? So if I have a dislocation density rho, then what is the shear stress resistance that that dislocation density provides? I've got a certain amount of dislocations, how much hardening does it cause? Yeah. Rho is your dislocation density, and then, yeah, you are on the right track. 
Okay. So I, I think you've been to uh, Professor de Kuman's lectures, right? And strengthening due to dislocations, it's rho to the power of a half, yeah, because the spacing between dislocations, in other words, the barriers, uh, vary with the square root of the dislocation density. Then you have the shear modulus and the Burgers vector. Yeah. So this will be opposed by the presence of dislocations. So what resists the motions of the dislocations? Well, we've got a certain dislocation density in the austenite caused by the relaxation of the shape deformation, and we call that a row. And the shear stress which opposes the movement of the interface will be proportional to the dislocation density to power of a half, yeah? because that gives you effectively the spacing between dislocations. And this is just the Burgers vector, B, and mu is the shear modulus of the austenite, and C is a constant depending on uh, various things, but it's of the order of a half. Yeah? So this is opposing the movement of dislocations. Now, supposing we didn't have any, any dislocations, what would oppose the movement of the interface? Uh, no carbides. Uh, no grain boundaries. Solid solution. Yeah, that also causes hardening, doesn't it? Yeah. So we need to add to this a term due to solid solution, right? And if the stress caused by the chemical free energy change, tau, is less than the resistance provided by the dislocations and solid solution strengthening, we will stop transformation, okay? And this can only happen with a displacive transformation because a displacive transformation requires a glissile interface. That means an interface which must be able to move without diffusion. So if you deform the austenite and the transformation stops, then the mechanism of transformation is displacive. If you deform the austenite and you cannot retard the transformation, doesn't matter how much strain you put in, then the transformation involves a lot of diffusion. It's like recrystallization where a new grain grows and eats up all the defects and therefore that drives recrystallization. Recrystallization is driven only by the driving force to eliminate defects. Yeah. So reconstructive transformation is like recrystallization plus phase change. I mean, you can get a reconstructive transformation in pure iron, right, just by cooling slowly. So it doesn't have to form two different phases. Right, so we are coming to a really important result. Uh, first, I want to show you uh, some experimental evidence where we first deform the austenite and then transform it to bainite. So this is a very simple experiment where you take a cylinder and you squash it. Yeah? Uh, push along here and you squash it. And because there is a friction over here, this cylinder becomes barreled. Yeah? Now, this is a big advantage, the barreling, because the strain distribution, plastic strain distribution is not uniform. Right? You, can, you can do your, your sort of calculation where that's a finite element model, and you can see that the strain is very, very high here, and it's zero in the dead zone. The dead zone is the zone which is in contact with the cylinder, and if there's friction, then you will get no deformation. So in a single experiment, you can look at the effect of strain on phase transformation. Yeah. You don't have to do several experiments with different values of strain. Right, so we deform the austenite first, and then we allow it to transform into bainite. And remember what I said, that mechanical stabilization is only possible when you have a displacive transformation because the interface must be glissal. Yeah. So the interface must be like this. And in the case of 
reconstructive transmission, you never get mechanical stabilization because there must be diffusion to allow the interface to move. Okay? So this is a fundamental principle which allows you to distinguish using a macroscopic test the atomic mechanism of transformation. If the interface is glissile and you have displacements, those displacements are opposed by any hardening of the austenite. Right, so this is the undeformed sample, subsequently transformed to bainite, and you can see it's got a fairly uniform hardness. Okay? All of this is bainite. Uh, this is the severely deformed specimen, and there are strain gradients here. Here there is a very large strain and almost no transformation to bainite. It's all martensite, that's why it etches light. Do you remember the first micrograph I showed you where the martensite etches light and the bainite etches dark, right? So these regions simply haven't transformed. Right? Uh, and that's reflected in the very high hardness. And if you look at the metallography, in the dead zone, you've got plenty of bainite, yeah? Uh, very little of the martensite. And in there, you've got very, very little bainite. So you've actually retarded the transformation by deforming the austenite, and that is the meaning of mechanical stabilization. Okay? So, you know, if you decide that you want to produce a bainitic steel by thermomechanical processing, you would actually suppress the bainite transformation unless there was a sufficiently large driving force for transformation. Okay? And this applies to any displacive transformation, whether it's martensite or bainite or weedman staten ferrite. Uh, it is general to all transformations where a glissile interface is important. Oh, well, you miss, you came late, you see. So, <laughs> um, we, we are looking at this using optical microscopy. And this is a specimen containing a mixture of bainite and martensite. And you can see that there is a structure inside the bainite, and therefore it etches dark. Martensite, untempered, etchant doesn't attack it very much, and therefore it appears light. Of course, optical microscopy cannot resolve the fine detail, but you can distinguish bainite and martensite in optical microscopy. Yeah. So you can see these light etching regions here are the martensite, and these dark etching regions are the bainite. Similarly, the light etching region here is martensite, and this is the bainite. Okay? Okay, so we've established how mechanical stabilization works and how important it is in understanding the atomic mechanism of transformation. Let's see now how it influences the structure of bainite. So once again, we have this plastic relaxation in the austenite adjacent to the bainite, and I showed you that there are intense dislocation tangles at the austenite ferrite interface, which stop the plate of bainite from growing before it hits any obstacle like an austenite grain boundary. Okay. So it starts to grow and then suddenly stops when enough dislocations have formed in the austenite. So if you look at the platelet at a sufficiently high resolution, you will see it's not touching anything, and yet it has stopped growing. So to get more transformation, you have to form a new plate. And this is a beautiful mechanism of refining the structure. Yeah. It kills itself, basically, and therefore new plates have to form, which remain very fine. So again, this is now an optical microscope image. And which is the bainite here? It's a dark, dark, yeah, dark etching region. And the rest is martensite. So this is an optical micrograph. You can see the scale. I'm going to show you one of these objects now in a transmission electron micro micrograph. Okay? So we're going to blow up just one of these black things which looks like a plate. 
Okay, this is really quite spectacular. So this is a montage. Obviously, a TEM looks at a small region, so you have to take many, many photographs to build this up. So starting from here, here, you can see that actually it consists of thousands of tiny plates which grow to a certain size top. So for example, the size of the plate here is the same as the size of the plate which formed last. Okay? So they're all forming, stopping to grow, form another one, another one, another one, and the overall shape is that of a plate, again to minimize strain energy, but the scale here is one micrometer, and each of these plates is only about 0 0.2 micrometers in thickness. So you've achieved an enormous refinement of structure. If this was martensite, this would be a single plate okay. because of the absence of that plastic accommodation or, or minimal plastic accommodation and a greater driving force. So this is called the subunit mechanism of bainite transformation where this is called a subunit or a little platelet, right? And the transformation propagates by repeated nucleation of many of these small platelets. Yeah, the, this, in the optical micrograph, which is here, yeah, the, one of these objects is what I've got here. This, you mean? So that's, no, 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 this is a transmission micrograph, there's no etching. Okay, so, so the white plates are the plates of bainite. In between we have another phase, which, uh, yeah, it can be cementite, it can be retained austenite, okay, depending on the chemical composition of the steel. Yeah. Here we are looking through the metal. Hmm. Everyone happy with this? Okay. okay. Um, we need to think a little bit more about the mechanism of transformation and there's an instrument called an atom probe where you can see individual atoms and pick them out and identify what they are by looking at time of flight mass spectroscopy. And you can even form an image with particular species of atoms. Okay, so you can form an image with just the silicon atoms or just the iron atoms or carbon atoms. And here is an interface between the bainitic ferrite and the austenite where each individual dot represents a single atom. Okay? Uh, this is the iron atoms and the silicon atoms and the carbon atoms. Now you can see that there's no redistribution, no partitioning of silicon, right? But look, the carbon is on one side in the austenite. So when we look, in detail at the distribution of carbon, it looks as if the carbon has partitioned into the austenite, which has a greater solubility for carbon. Okay. Uh, so you might say that during the growth of bainite, there is diffusion of carbon. Okay. But I want to show you one more possibility. You know, it could be that the bainite forms exactly like martensite, without any diffusion. But because we are operating at a higher temperature, the carbon has an opportunity to escape into the austenite. So it's like a tempering reaction. And in modern terminology, you know, you have this uh, uh, special steel called Q and P, quench and partitioning. Have you heard of that? Where you take martensite, partially transform to martensite, then you heat it up and let the carbon escape into the austenite to make it richer in carbon. Yeah, that's called the quench and partitioning steel. In the case of bainite, it could be that it forms without any diffusion, but the carbon partitions afterwards. So I want to calculate the time taken for carbon to escape from the... Also is one kind of diffusion. Sorry? Partition absolutely requires diffusion. Yeah? This is diffusion of an interstitial element. The substitution atoms simply don't move. Right? So I need to be able to answer is carbon there inside the bainite during its growth stage? Because in the next lecture, we are going to design a very beautiful steel using the principles we've learned in the first three lectures. Right? So I need to know what's happening to carbon during the transformation. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay. So if I calculate the time taken for carbon to escape from the plate of bainite as a function of temperature, so assuming that it forms exactly like martensite, if I calculate the time, it's of the order of seconds or less. That means by the time I look at the sample, things will have changed. So that indicates there's no way I can determine whether carbon diffuses during transformation or after transformation because I can't actually put it into the instrument, look at it, and by that time everything has changed. Carbon is very mobile. It sits in the holes inside the lattice. Okay? So that's a problem because I want to do calculations to design steels. Right? Okay, here is where thermodynamics becomes extremely useful. Okay, so do you remember what the T0 curve is? Can you explain to me? It's not equilibrium, yeah? Equilibrium uh, is the A1 and the A3 where you get the same chemical potential for the solids. Right, right. So I need a little bit more detail. You said it defines where displacive transformation happens, but um, strictly speaking, what does it mean? Yeah, so you cannot uh, transform austenite, which is on this side of the T0 curve, without a composition change. Okay. So only if the austenite has carbon concentration less than this red curve, is it thermodynamically possible for it to transform without a composition change? Okay, you remember I explained that if I have austenite of this composition and I transform it to ferrite without a, a composition change, there's an increase in free energy. But on this side, there's a reduction. So it's possible in principle. Okay, so we are going to do a thought experiment. So here's my T0 curve, and this is the equilibrium curve where the reaction would stop if carbon partitions during transformation. But supposing it forms like martensite, okay, and this is the average carbon concentration of our steel, X bar. So the first plate of bainite will form with a composition X bar, and then the carbon that is inside the plate will escape into the austenite, make the austenite richer in carbon. Right? So the next plate of bainite forms displaced along this axis because the austenite is now richer in carbon and this continues until the composition of the austenite hits the T0 curve. This kind of transformation is impossible beyond the T0 curve. Okay? And of course if you transform at a lower temperature you'll get more bainite because the T0 composition is further along the carbon axis. So, supposing that I measure the carbon concentration of the austenite at the point where the reaction stops, then I can distinguish between the diffusionless mechanism and the equilibrium mechanism, where diffusion happens during growth. Okay? Right, so it's very easy. We've got many, many techniques to do these measurements now. You allow the transformation to continue until it stops and then measure the composition of the austenite allowing for strain energy, right? Yeah, because we have a large strain energy term. And sure enough, so this T0 dash curve is T0 allowing for strain energy, okay? Uh, you can see that the reaction basically stops well before the austenite reaches its equilibrium composition. There's a huge difference there between T0 and A3, okay? So this means that the plate forms exactly like martensite without any diffusion, but shortly afterwards the carbon partitions into the remaining austenite because the temperature is high enough to allow that to happen. So it's as if it's tempering itself during transformation. Yeah? So you form the plate of martensite and the carbon then escapes. It's partly answering your question in one of the lectures where you said what is the difference between martensite and bainite and so on. It's almost as if it's martensite which tempers itself during 
while you hold it at that temperature and the carbon partitions. And the second difference is that it's forming at a lower driving force. So the relaxation of the austenite, the plastic relaxation, stops the plate from growing very large. Yeah. So structural difference and also the fact that it's forming at a higher temperature allows the carbon to escape rapidly. This also means, uh, now supposing we accept this mechanism, then there are many other predictions you can make about the Bayonite transformation, which can be verified experimentally. So if I transform at a temperature close to T0, I will get very little transformation. As I go below T0, I get more and more transformation. Okay. Because you remember the number of plates that can form is smaller at a higher temperature than at a lower temperature. And at BS, the Bayonite start temperature, you will get zero Bayonite, even though equilibrium says you are in a two-phase field. Right. So this, because the amount of Bayonite doesn't approach equilibrium but stops at T0, this is called the incomplete reaction. Right. You form a volume fraction of bainite which is far less than equilibrium would say because of the mechanism of transformation. Okay. So to summarize, uh, this is all you need to know is that the growth of bainite is diffusionless. Carbon may partition shortly afterwards and of course, we have to account for the strain energy due to the displacements in doing any calculations of kinetics or thermodynamics or microstructure. Everyone happy with that? Okay. Now, supposing there was a method by which you could measure the growth rate of the individual platelet, very, very fine platelet. So we could do it using confocal laser microscopy because the scale of that, the resolution of that is uh, too coarse for a plate which is only 0 0.2 micrometers thick, right? Uh, so you cannot do it using hot stage optical microscopy. You have to use electron microscopy, okay? And there is one very, very special technique called photo emission electron microscopy in which you take your sample which is a large sample and you put it inside this microscope and you, uh, at a high temperature austenite okay uh, say a thousand degrees centigrade you allow it to cool to the bainite transformation temperature and then you shine uh, light onto it which causes the emission of electrons, pho photo emission of electrons. And then you use all the lenses that are normal in a transmission microscope to form the image. So it's like a hot stage optical, mi uh, hot stage optical microscope, but we are using electrons to form the image. Yeah? So it's like a hot stage transmission electron microscope. We are not using a thin specimen, but we are causing electrons to emit by shining light onto the sample. Okay, so I'm going to show you a sequence of four images, and you can find this movie on the website, where you will actually see bainite plates growing. Individual bainite plates, not collections of plates. Because if you look at collections of plates, then there's also nucleation involved, right? Okay, so watch the screen carefully. Uh, uh, in this region and you can see uh, after one second we've got these plates here can you see them very thin plates yeah. and two seconds they've grown bigger and three seconds and so on and there are many many observations like this yeah so why do we do this well we want to measure the growth rate of an individual plate it be much faster than would be permitted by diffusion if the theory is correct. When you do that, you find it's three orders of magnitude faster than carbon diffusion would allow. Okay? So that's completely consistent with the theory that we have developed. Okay. Uh, in one of the early lectures, I pointed out to you 
that there is upper bainite and lower bainite. Yeah, I'll show you the original slide. Yeah, you can see uh, in upper bainite the plates are free from carbides, whereas in lower bainite there are some internal carbides and less carbides between the plates. So does our model predict that? Well, when we are forming at a high temperature, the time taken for carbon to escape from the plate is shorter than at a lower temperature. So at the lower temperature, there's an opportunity to precipitate some carbides inside the plate. So you now have a model for predicting the transition from upper to lower bainite. Have you, has anybody got the notes? Uh, are those the notes? Can I just borrow that? Yeah. I just want to find this diagram which Not, not to worry, I can't find it, <laughs> okay? But, um, thank you. But basically, this forms like this because the carbon can escape rapidly. Here, there's an opportunity for carbides to precipitate. And therefore, if you have a model for carbide precipitation and you have the time for carbide precipitation compared with the time for diffusion, you can predict at what point there will be a transition from upper to lower bainite. Okay? Right. Yes, yes, that's right. So you're forming at a lower temperature, so carbon doesn't have an opportunity to escape during the transformation. Yeah? Uh, and also, you know, the driving force is much larger, so you don't get this subunit mechanism of growth. Right, let me go back to the... So you see this particular slide is not visible for some reason. Ah. No, but that removes uh, many parts of the image. Okay. <laughs> you can find this in my Steele's book, all right? And what it shows is carbon escaping from here and then precipitating in this region for upper bainite. And in this case, some of the carbon escapes and some of it precipitates inside the plate. And therefore, you end up with the lower bainite microstructure. OK, so we have a theory. And we can put that in a computer program, work out the time taken for car carbide to precipitate, work out the time taken for carbon to escape. If the time taken for carbon to escape is shorter than precipitation, then you have upper bainite. And if the reverse, then you have lower bainite. And here are some calculations. Uh, so this is the bainite start temperature. As we cool, we get upper bainite, yeah? because uh, here we have a low carbon concentration, so the time taken for carbon to escape is quite short. So you don't get precipitation. On the other hand, at a higher carbon concentration, you get uh, the carbon takes longer to escape, so you get precipitation inside the plate and you end up with lower bainite. But one of the strange things, which meant that I didn't believe this calculation for a long time, is I go from perlite here to upper bainite to martensite. There's no lower bainite here. Here, I go from perlite to lower bainite to martensite. There's no upper bainite. All the books will tell you that, you know, as you cool, you go from perlite to upper bainite to lower bainite to martensite. Yeah, so these are just calculations. So you shouldn't believe calculations unless there is some evidence. So we went and looked at the literature 
more carefully. And people didn't realize that they actually have observed this. So here, for example, are results from Oka and Okamoto for high carbon steels. And sure enough, you go directly from perlite to lower bainite to martensite. Yeah, look where the carbon concentration starts here, as predicted. There's no upper bainite here. And they did a lot of microstructural observations. And similarly, if you go back to 1971, Omori and Honeycomb, and you focus on the low carbon region here, you go from perlite to upper bainite to martensite. There's no lower bainite. Okay? So the evidence existed in the literature, but everyone assumed that you always have upper bainite, lower bainite, and then martensite. But it depends on the relative times of precipitation and carbon escaping from the plate. Okay? Partitioning of carbon after transformation, yes. They have. Uh, no. So, again, what you have to think about is how does the structure change when the carbon partitions? Yeah? So, both martensite and bainite can be tetragonal or orthorhombic. They, they have the same crystal structures depending on alloy composition and so on. So, okay, so we can predict when low bainite is going to form and when upper bainite is going to form. So wh what I want to emphasize is that just because we get agreement with T0, that's not the only confirmation of mechanism. Just because mechanical stabilization happens, everything should fit together. Yeah? There are just too many papers published which look at just one aspect and reach a conclusion. But you have to, once you reach a conclusion from one aspect, you have to show that everything else agrees with the mechanism of transformation. And then you can make progress, yeah? Okay, so that's the end of martensite and of bainite. And at the moment, it might seem, why do we need to learn about, you know, the atomic mechanisms of transformation, right? You know, we are dealing with big lumps of steel and 1.3 billion tons of them. But in the next lecture, I'm going to show you how to design really good bainitic steels which have become commercial using this theory. Okay? So come back very excited for the next lecture. Okay, thank you.